Um, but after this case, Ed, who did testify in this case, I think made a very good proposal that in the in the future, uh, scientific experts should uh, discuss the reliability of a technology before, without knowing what the results are. In other words, without knowing whether the results help the prosecution or help the defense. Because the issue of a given technology is reliable should in principle be independent of what the results are. But in the adversarial system, uh, that's not the way it's done. So as I said, the most dramatic case I was ever involved in was the Earl Washington Jr. case. He was convicted of rape and murder in Virginia. He had confessed, so he was mentally retarded. And he was scheduled to be executed in January of 1994, actually a few days before um, he was scheduled to be executed. Actually, just maybe 36 hours, I got um, the lab results and was asked to write a report by the defense attorney. So this was a case uh, where the sperm fraction was mixed. And um, so this is going to be a continuing theme here in this, in this founder's lecture today, the challenge of analyzing mixtures uh, in forensics. So <clears throat> this is the genotype of the victim. The husband, Earl Washington Jr., was a 1.24 heterozygote. And the sperm fraction contained three different alleles. So the prosecution said, you know, this data is consistent with him being the rapist because his alleles are present, 1.2 and 4. But as you know, people are genotypes, not alleles. And so based on the intensity of the blue dots, I said there's a major genotype, 1.1, 1.2, and a minor uh, contribution of four, which you'll notice could come from the victim. And of course, there's a real present 1.1, which is absent uh, in World Pearl Washington Jr. So although the alleles are present, the way you interpret, or the way I interpreted this, was based on genotype analysis, and that excluded Earl Washington Jr. as a possible contributor. And so what, uh, just hours before he was scheduled to be executed, I sent this report, which said this interpretation would result in an exclusion of Earl Washington Jr. So the conviction was overturned, and subsequent analysis confirmed that this was not his firm. But it, it, for me, it just uh, emphasized the challenge of interpreting mixtures and how important they can be. So, so far I've been talking about how PCR could be used for sequence-based uh, genetic typing, but in fact, you know, relatively early on, we also realized that PCR could, could use, uh, be used for looking at length polymorphism. So basically, you just design primers that flank uh, this locus of variable variable length, and then whatever you amplify can be run on a gel or capillary, and you can do genotyping that way. And so in the early days, these were called amplips. And this is one of the earliest. We actually commercialized tests for the D1S80 locus, and this is a silver stain gel uh, using this length polymorphism. But I personally was concerned about length polymorphisms because in the heterozygote, if the length of, if one allele was much shorter than the other, you'd get differential amplification and that could read, lead to problems. But one approach to that, that I think was initially suggested by Tom Kasky, was to use very short tandem repeats, just tetranucleotide repeats. And um, <clears throat> that of course led, as we all know, to the standard uh, SDR panel. This was the original CODIS panel, as you now know from wandering around the exhibitor's booth, that they're now SDR panels with many, many uh, additional loci. But the additional loci, or the additional system was actually very nice to use fluorescent, uh, fluorescent labels and capillary electrophoresis. Um, and you know, could be used uh, to analyze mixtures because it had, each locus had multiple alleles. 
and the alleles can be recognized uh, separated on gels. You know, there's still technical problems. You know, as we all know, you have stutter bands, and you still, it's still difficult to be quantitative by looking at the area underneath the curve. But still, it was valuable. But uh, you still had the problem of putting, uh, trying to create genotypes from alleles. You had to make assumptions about how the alleles go together. That's one of the reasons I was so interested in looking many, many years ago at mitochondrial DNA, because in addition to all of these different uh, properties that are very, very useful, for instance, in particular, the fact that a given cell can have thousands of copies, is that it's haploid. So that excluding the issue of heteroplasmy, the expectation is that one individual has one sequence. And so if there are two or three sequences in, in a mixture, you figure that there are two or three contributors. So that's much more straightforward and requires many, many fewer assumptions than trying to analyze nuclear alleles uh, in a mixture and putting them together as genotypes. So very early on, we developed a system. This is just P32 labeled probes uh, for mitochondrial DNA. This was uh, worked out by Mark Stone King, who was a visiting scientist in the lab. Uh, and because this was relatively early, we were doing P32 labeling and dot logs. But here you can see that there's a father, a mother, and then these are just controls. And this was a missing a skeleton from a girl who was missing. And she does match the mother. So <clears throat> this turned out to be a very useful uh, marker for missing persons, but also for forensics. And, and this was worked out for Sanger sequencing. This is an exclusion. And uh, working with uh, Sandy Callaway and her colleagues, uh, we developed an immobilized probe system. So this is like the DQ alpha dots, but now uh, in a uh, linear array. And this was actually commercialized by uh, Sandy and by Roche. And she went on to um, make this a more informative system by looking at the whole genome. And actually, the International Coalition for Missing Persons uh, has been using this system for a number of years, uh, characterizing mass uh, brave remains. But for me, anyway, the technology that is now most exciting for the analysis of mixtures uh, is next generation sequencing. So next generation sequencing is, you know, has two fundamental components. It's massively parallel. So you can generate millions of sequences. Uh, for, for, in a forensic setting, it's a platform where in principle you can look at uh, nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA, SDRs, SNPs, and uh, you can get very high uh, read depth that looks for rare variants and mixture analysis. And the fact that it's clonal means that you're sequencing single molecules so that you can separate the components of the mixture and analyze them individually. And you can analyze them quantitatively by doing what we refer to as a visual readout, or simply counting the sequence reads for each contributor in the mixture. <coughs> now, because of my interest in immunogenetics and other clinical applications, uh, I was interested in next-gen sequencing and the analysis of clinically relevant mixtures. And one of the things we were very interested in is quantifying the amount of fetal DNA in the maternal plasma. So the plasma, the cell-free compartment, is actually not unlike forensic specimens. There's not very much DNA there, and it's very low molecular weight. It's around 100, 150 base pairs. So the challenge is uh, looking at uh, involved in genotyping uh, DNA from uh, plasma, very similar to looking at uh, DNA from forensic specimens. So here we wanted to just count the reads derived from the fetus and see what pro if we could estimate the proportion of fetal DNA. So as you know, HLA is very polymorphic. We looked for a sequence in the father that was absent in the mother. And so if we found the sequence in the maternal plasma, it could only come from the fetus. So here we can quantitate the number of reads from the fetus. <coughs> and in three different runs, 
you know, 7.5 percent, 7.4 percent, 7.4 percent. So this is just the paternal allele of the fetus. So the total amount of fetal DNA was about 15 percent. Now we were because we're immunologists and interested in transplants. We also were interested in could we have early detection of acute rejection in a kidney transplant recipient. So again, we looked for um, DNA present or alleles present in the donor absent in the recipient. And here you can see these are the counts for the recipient. These are the counts for the donor. And this is the background. So <clears throat> the background is just derived from the very abundant recipient alleles and there's a single misincorporation. But anyway, so this is just background noise and this is the signal. So about two and a half to three and a half percent of <coughs> the DNA in this uh, transplant recipient who's undergoing acute rejection uh, is from the donor. And we're pursuing this to see if we can make this clinically relevant. But uh, even <coughs> with uh, forensic mixers and next generation sequencing, you're identifying alleles. <coughs> and so you have to infer multiple genotypes uh, <coughs> from these alleles. And that involves, as I said earlier, uh, certain assumptions. So haploid, haploid lineage markers uh, are extremely useful for estimating the number of contributors. And <coughs> this is a system uh, developed by um, Sandy Calloway and her colleagues looking at the mitochondrial uh, hypervariable region, HV1, HV2. And <clears throat> in, this is a buccal swab sample that shows some heteroplasmy, the blood that does not, and the buccal from another individual, blood from that individual that does not. <coughs> so by Sanger sequencing, you can see that there you can detect the minority component just barely here. Uh, in the buckle, but not at all in the blood, but by 454 sequencing the next gen system, you can see that here, 2% is the minority heteroplastic variant. Here, about 5% is the minority variant. And this can be very useful in mixtures. <coughs> here are the three different mixtures, um, or, or mixture of three contributors, and you can see that you can identify the three component sequences you know, in a quantitative way. Uh, what we notice here is that there were also, at a very, very low level, some hybrid sequences that were due to a phenomenon that we recognized from the very early days of PCR. We call it jumping PCR or PCR crossovers in vitro. And here, <coughs> I've just shown the mechanism for this, that a primer in a cycle, let's say N, can anneal and then be extended, but uh, at the end of that cycle, you haven't completed that. So you denature it, <coughs> and at the end, at the subsequent N plus one cycle, this partially extended primer anneals to another template that is extended, and so you end up with a hybrid, um, a hybrid molecule, which can complicate your analysis. But because this is familiar to us and we understand the kinetics of PCR, we know that this is a phenomenon that happens at late PCR cycles when PCR products have accumulated to very high concentration, when the primer concentration is low at late cycles because it's been used up, and when the enzyme concentration is low because it's been used up. So it's like the, the case of a patient going to a doctor. He says, doctor, it hurts when I do this. And the doctor says, don't do this. <laughs> so basically, this happens in late cycles. So we decided to do fewer cycles. And here, another experiment <coughs> from Sandy Calloway's lab. You have a mixture of A and B. And at 34 cycles, you have all these hybrid crossover in vitro artifacts. 24 cycles, this is reduced to less than 1%. And it can be reduced to nothing. So, we understand this phenomenon, but we have to be aware of it. And this is true not just in forensics, but in HLA typing as well. So one of the things that Sandy has been uh, involved in and I've been very interested in 
is trying to increase the informativeness of mitochondrial genetic typing. So, so far, the data that I discussed was just the hypervariable region one and hypervariable region two. But of course, the mitochondrial genome is on the order of 16 kilobases, so there's a lot of DNA there that one could, in principle, look at. So Sandy developed a method called hybrid capture, where you, design, working with Nimbleton, you design probes to <coughs> capture mitochondrial sequences from whole genomic DNA. The way this works is first you fragment your DNA, and on the blue here is shown the protocol that results in 4 by 4 sequencing. In the green, shown the protocol that ends up uh, with uh, sequencing on the aluminum mice. So these are two different next-gen uh, platforms. And, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but basically the idea is that you add adapters and barcodes and <clears throat> then hybridize to probes, uh, recover the hybridized the, the DNA that's hybridized, amplify it a little more, and then you have your library ready and you can uh, sequence it. And this just shows that the system that Sandy has developed gives you, this is the base positions along the genome, and this is coverage in terms of numbers of reads. So you get very good coverage on a variety of different <coughs> samples. Here you can see that there's one, this one sample had a little dip here, but you're getting 100% coverage. And even with very small amounts of DNA, limiting DNA, you get very good coverage. In fact, it's uh, oh, well over 90% of all the reads align to uh, the mitochondrial reference sequence, so that the hybrid capture is a very specific and effective way of targeting enrichment, and you also cover the whole mitochondrial genome. So Rachel Gordon and uh, Sandy's group is presenting a poster here on Thursday, and this is uh, her work on mechanical degradation, where we're trying to mimic uh, mimic forensic specimens. And here you can see uh, that even with 100 picograms, you're getting very good coverage. Um, and um, here, over 80% of all the reads are aligned with that kind of reference and 100% coverage. And um, Cindy's group has also gone on to look at bones. And here, again, you get very good coverage, 100% um, coverage. And in this case, 44% of the reads um, are aligned with the mitochondrial reference. And now, some ancient bones. <coughs> so there's this is a much more challenging kind of sample. And here you can see only about five or seven percent of the reads align. But you can see that hype, but you're still getting extremely good coverage of the mitochondrial genome. And so you get very, very, uh, very good coverage and therefore information from these ancient bones as well. Now with the sequences, this is a 454 readout, but in a mixture, <coughs> That was about 10%. Just looking at individual bases, uh, you can see that you're capturing uh, a minority in a quantitative way. Uh, so we're looking at those bases that differ between the two components in this mixture. And again, this is a whole genome capture. And this is one with aluminum where it's 5%. But so it is a very powerful way to look at mixtures and use the informative of power of the whole mitochondrial genome. So the last slide I want to show uh, is one that I made because in discussions with people uh, talking about mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA, say, well, it's very great, you know, it's a wonderful system, but it's not very informative because it's always limited <coughs> by the size of the database. So if, if for example, there's a crime scene profile that matches a suspect but is absent from your reference population database, the conventional wisdom would be, okay, you got a match, what does it mean? We have N individuals in the database, so the probability of a random match can only be 
around or less than one over n. And if you want to be really conservative, you can take the 95% confidence interval, and that's usually, you know, uh, three over n or something. So, you know, if your database is only a thousand or ten thousand, it's true, it's a great genetic marker, but it's not hugely informative. But Charles Brenner has pointed out that <clears throat> that uh, when you're looking at the random match probability, probability is not always equal to frequency. So his analysis suggests that what you really want to estimate is the probability of, of picking this profile in, in the next sample. So what is the probability that someone would, would match? And what he points out is in order to <coughs> make this statistically robust and accurate, you have to introduce the concept of kappa, where kappa is the proportion of singletons in the database. So here you can see if the proportions of singletons in the database is 99%. This way of looking at it is 100, is this now is 1 over 100 at more or less instead of 1 over n. So, <clears throat> My point is that if you now sequence the whole mitochondrial genome instead of just HV1 and HV2, most of those, the vast majority of those sequences are going to be singletons. And so if, if your marker is the whole mitochondrial genome and you use the Brenner formulation, suddenly mitochondrial DNA becomes about 100 times more informative than it is using this conventional thing. So I'd like to stop there and thank all of my colleagues who've um, been involved with me in, in forensics over the years, Ed Blake and as I mentioned earlier, Jennifer. I wouldn't be standing here if it weren't for the two of them. In the early days uh, of forensics, I also worked with Russ Iguchi and Becky Reynolds at CETUS and now I have the opportunity <coughs> and the good fortune to continue working with Sandy Calloway and her colleagues who've been applying these kind of analysis uh, with next generation sequencing uh, to the analysis of uh, current specimens. And finally, I want to thank all my colleagues at CETAS, Roche, and other institutions uh, who contributed uh, to the evolution of application of UCO and to all of those, like the P5 colleagues at the International Coalition for Living Persons who've been applying uh, PCR for the cause of social justice. So thank you very much. Should I take questions or what's? Go ahead. Oh, Sandy. <laughs> uh, nice talk. I know early in the days of PCR and introducing it into the court, there were um, some challenges that needed to be overcome. Could you address some of those and then also as we move into introducing next generation sequencing, what are some of the challenges you foresee that we may run into there? Yeah, no, this is very interesting. Both of those are very interesting questions. So in the early days of PCR, you know, on the, the issue with, with RFLP was how do you determine a match uh, when there's so many alleles, how do you estimate allele frequency? You know, what are the assumptions in uh, determining statistical estimates and uh, random match probabilities. With PCR, there was a concern about contamination because, you know, if you can amplify from a single molecule, there was a lot of anxiety uh, about <coughs> amplifying some extraneous material. Um, so there are a number of things uh, that were done uh, people change their lab procedures, so there is as many of you know a pre-PCR and a post-PCR, so you're very careful not to uh, contaminate uh, the material that you're actually about to amplify with PCR products from previously amplified samples. So I'd say one of the main concerns was about um, contamination. and. Uh, Sometimes there was some confusion about 
genetic typing. So I'll just give you one example, and I won't name any names. Ed knows exactly who I'm talking about. But there's a very distinguished scientist <coughs> at the time at UC Berkeley who testified that the alleles that were being recognized uh, by our PCR HLA system, um, that that system was missing an allele. And so <coughs> that turned out just to be a misconception and a confusion on um, the part of that scientist. But um, nonetheless, that testimony in the admissibility hearings propagated, and every time I testify, uh, you know, I get questions about that. And in, in general, the, the issue of allelic dropout or differential amplification, you know, was also a, a potential issue. But, uh, you know, I think as the protocols became um, standardized, um, you know, that, that concern went away. But so those were for the initial. Let me just answer uh, Sandy's second question, then I'll go on. And I, and I think, uh, Sandy, your second question was about next generation sequencing and what are, will be the challenges there. Right. If, um, just in, we know that anytime we introduce a new technology, um, we have to go forward. And what yeah. do you perceive the challenges of introducing next generation sequencing to be? Yeah, no, I, I think there will be challenges, and I think they'll be appropriate uh, because I think now, you know, we've moved away from a lot of the adversarial aspects. I think we know that. Uh, forensic DNA analysis is way too valuable um, for both defense and prosecution to be challenged in a fundamental way. But, but I think <clears throat> there'll be questions about possible sequencing error. You know, if you're sequencing 16 KB and you want to match, um, you know, two sequences and assert that they're the same, or, or even assert that they're different. You know, what is the the confidence in <coughs> the base calls that distinguish those sequences. So, and those are totally appropriate, and we'll have to develop guidelines for, I think, NGS. And also, maybe set a threshold. If, if you're looking at a mixture, we know that there's background, you know, around 1%. And so there'll have to be some guidelines, you know, what might, what is appropriate to call a minor variant as opposed to just the background, uh, background noise that could come uh, from sequencing error or PCR misincorporation or something like that. Ed, you also had a point? Yeah, I was going to take issue with your uh, unwillingness to name names. Ah. <laughs> I mean, supposedly, <coughs> science has something to do with uh, cancer. And when people step outside the box, mm -hmm. that ought to be pointed out fairly. And the individual that you're talking about, you in fact wrote a letter to the editor of the Journal of Forensic Sciences pointing out this person's uh, faux pas, if as, as it were. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then the, the other thing is, is it, it's, it's incorrect to assume that any time there is a challenge, that the challenge is uh, an intellectually honest challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, after all, we are part of the adversarial system, and not everybody that participates in the system participates in an honest way. And the, the early history uh, of the admissibility wars, as, as you talked about, has many examples of that. Uh, the Mello case that you presented, uh, quite frankly, in my judgment, the uh, prosecution's approach to that case constituted attempted murder of Mr. Mello because they were trying to undermine a, an analysis that clearly showed that Mr. Mello was not the sperm source, which was the, the critical aspect, the critical fact that the prosecution used to seek the death, death penalty against him unsuccessfully. Additionally, if this individual that you want to conceal had been successful in her attempts to undermine 
the PCR analysis in Mello. In all likelihood, Mr. Mello would have been convicted of raping his grandmother and in all likelihood would have been sentenced to death. These are not trivial things to simply push under the rug 